You're welcome to another exciting session in biology. Today, we shall be looking at the topic, maintenance of internal environment. In the theme, organism at work. This is the second part of this topic, and in this part, we'll continue a lesson on the kidney. By the end of today's class, you should be able to describe the regulatory functions of the kidneys. You should also be able to identify some examples of kidney diseases. And you should be able to define the effect or describe the effects of kidney diseases on homeostasis. At the beginning of this topic, that's in the part one of this topic, we said homeostasis is the maintenance of a constant internal environment within the bodies of living organisms. In that same previous lesson, we said some organs of homeostasis include the kidney, the liver, lungs, skin, and the endocrine glands. We also said the brain is the control center for homeostasis. We also looked at some factors that are regulated in the bodies of living organisms. Such factors include temperature, concentration of solutes or electrolytes in the body fluid. We also looked at the concentration of sugar and the concentration of other substances. Even the volume of water is a factor that is regulated in the bodies of living organisms. We started a lesson on the kidney, where we say the kidney are bean shaped organs that are located in the abdominal cavity of the stomach. We also looked at the structures of the kidney. And in today's class, we shall be learning about how the kidney regulates certain substances and the diseases that affect the kidney. The kidneys filter blood, they regulate the volume of fluids, and they also regulate the concentration of various substances within the bodies of living organisms, or rather within the bodies of vertebrates. However, there are certain illnesses that affect the kidney, they disrupt the normal functional system of the kidney, and they affect homeostasis, they disrupt homeostasis. So when the kidney is diseased, the whole disease process of the kidney affects homeostasis. Kidney diseases are very, very dangerous. They cause various unpleasant situations in the bodies of living organisms. Kidney diseases are serious illnesses. These diseases may be severe and they could be life-threatening if they are not properly handled. People suffering from kidney diseases need to pay attention to them. Now before we look at the various types of kidney diseases, I'd like us to learn about how the kidney regulates certain substances. The first substance here is water. So we are looking at the regulation of water by the kidneys. How does the kidney regulate the volume of water in the blood? The kidneys help to regulate the amount of water excreted in the blood. Remember the structure of the kidney where water is either reabsorbed or secreted. They do this in order to keep the osmotic pressure of the blood constant. They balance the osmotic pressure of the blood. That's the function of homeostasis. Now let's look at a scenario where we consume too much salt. We eat too much salt in our food substances, or we drink very little water, or on hot days when we sweat profusely, let's say on days when we, we are involved in physical exercise, we get to sweat profusely and we lose so much water from our skin. When we eat too much salt as well, it means the salt concentration in our blood becomes higher and the water volume is reduced. Also, when we drink very little water, it means we don't have enough water in our blood. So the volume of water in the blood is also low. All of these three scenarios will make us dehydrated. That means our body systems are short of water. And when we are dehydrated, it means our blood is concentrated. There is just little water in the blood. This means that we need more water in our blood to balance the homeostasis or to balance the osmotic pressure of the blood. So when we get dehydrated, the solute concentration of the blood rises beyond normal. So the blood becomes concentrated, too concentrated. And when the solute concentration rises beyond normal, this will lead to an increased osmotic pressure. The osmotic pressure of the blood will rise. It will rise beyond normal. This is not so good for the body system. We don't need the osmotic pressure of the blood to be too high. So the brain or the body has to react. What does the body do? Quickly, some receptors at the brain which senses increase in osmotic pressure detect this increase. 
These receptors are called osmoreceptors. They are located somewhere in the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is a part of the brain. This is the hypothalamus in the brain. So osmoreceptors at this region detect the increased osmotic pressure. As soon as they detect this, they send it out to the brain. The brain receives it. The brain begins to get, oh, the body's osmotic pressure is too high. It's too high. We need to act. What does the brain do? Remember, the brain is a control center. The brain quickly sends or stimulates an endocrine gland called the posterior pituitary gland. This is the posterior pituitary gland. It's located very close to the brain. You can see, this is the pituitary gland. We have the anterior and the posterior, all located at this region of the brain. So this is the posterior. The brain stimulates the posterior pituitary gland to secrete a hormone. Remember, hormones are chemical messengers. They usually carry messages. So in this case, the hormone that is secreted by the posterior pituitary gland is called antidiuretic hormone. You can abbreviate it to ADH, antidiuretic hormone. What does this hormone do? The hormone is carried by the blood from the posterior pituitary gland down to the kidneys. It flows down to the kidneys in the abdominal cavity and at the kidney, the hormone goes straight to the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. Can you guess what the hormone does there? The hormone causes an increase in the reabsorption of water from this region of the nephron tubule back into the blood. Now, let me explain that at this region, we say the distal convoluted tubule. This is the distal convoluted tubule. And from here down to this region is the collecting duct. So we have the distal convoluted tubule and we have the collecting ducts. There are certain channels or we can say pores along this tubule that gives access to water to either go into the blood or pass into the tubule. So when this hormone is secreted, it causes those channels to open up. So those water channels on this tube will open up. These channels are called aquaporins. Can you see aquaporins here? So the aquaporins along the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts open up. They open up because the hormone is saying, we need water to go back into the blood. The blood is too concentrated. Can you send water into the blood? So aquaporins open up and water from the urine begins to flow back into the blood. Now this process continues until the osmotic pressure of the blood becomes normal. As this process is going on, the quantity of urine left in the lumen or left in this tubule, or the quantity of urine that is eventually produced, is reduced. And because it is reduced, it means the concentration is also very high. Yes, the concentration should be very high because a large volume of water has been reabsorbed from the urine. So we have little quantity of urine that is highly concentrated. So when ADH is secreted, we produce a more concentrated urine. We produce this kind of urine that is highly concentrated and is usually of a reduced quantity. This whole process of ADH causing the reabsorption of water from the tubule continues for a while until the osmotic pressure of the blood is restored back to normal. And when this happens, the osmoreceptors detect the normalized osmotic pressure. And they say, oh, the blood pressure is not normal. Brain, please, can you stop the secretion of ADH? And the brain quickly sends a message to the posterior pituitary gland to stop the secretion of ADH. So when this happens, ADH secretion is stopped. And there's no more ADH to cause the reabsorption of water from the tubules. This will lead to the decrease in the reabsorption of water, of course, and the volume of urine produced by the kidneys will be increased because water is no longer reabsorbed from the urine. This increased volume of urine will also lead to the production of dilute urine. So we have this kind of urine produced in large volume. So when ADA secretion is stopped, more water will be excreted in the urine. So we have excretion of large volume of water and excretion of dilute urine which is similar to this case. Also, when we drink too much water, or on cold days when we sweat less, what happens to the water volume of our body? It means we have more water volume in the blood. Of course, the volume of water increases because we have drank too much water, or there is no avenue for water to leave through sweat because we sweat less. The brain, 
detects these changes or this increase in water volume. They detect excess water in the blood. What do you think could happen to the osmotic pressure at that stage? It will be reduced. So, of course, it will be detected and sent to the brain. And when this happens, the brain stimulates the same posterior pituitary gland. They stimulate the same posterior pituitary gland to completely stop the secretion of ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Remember, the antidiuretic hormone causes reabsorption of water from the tubule. When ADH is not secreted, water will not be reabsorbed from the tubule. So what happens to the urine then? It means all the water in the urine will flow down from the distal convoluted tubule down to the collecting ducts and they are excreted along with the urine. So water is now reabsorbed. This will lead to the production of a highly diluted urine or it will lead to the production of dilute urine. What will happen to the volume of urine produced? Of course, the volume will be increased as well because more water is left to flow out with the urine. This whole process of regulating the reabsorption or the secretion of water by the kidneys also helps to control and regulate the volume of blood. When the volume of blood is too low, when the blood is too concentrated, the kidneys will help to reabsorb water back into the blood to stabilize the volume of the blood. And when ADH secretion is stopped or completely hindered, you have this kind of urine, dilute urine. You can see the color, it looks like it is dilute. That's the kind of urine you produce. And it's usually in large volume. You seem to urinate more frequently than when ADH is secreted. Okay, let's look at how the kidneys regulate sodium. They regulate the concentration of sodium in the blood. When the concentration of sodium in the blood becomes lower than normal, that's when the body system is short of sodium, what happens? The brain, which is the control center, detects this reduction in sodium concentration and they stimulate an endocrine gland. This endocrine gland is called adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are located on top of each kidney. You can see the adrenal gland. They are endocrine glands that secrete hormones. What do they do? The adrenal glands, when they are stimulated by the brain, they quickly secrete a hormone called aldosterone. Aldosterone now is a hormone that responds to changes in sodium concentration. They respond to changes in the blood sodium concentration. So as soon as aldosterone is secreted, it goes down to the tubule to cause active uptake of sodium. That means that there are certain channels along the tubule that helps to reabsorb sodium. Aldosterone causes those channels to open up and as soon as the channels are open, sodium freely moves into the blood. These active channels or these, these channels are located at the tubule, at the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting dots. Now, because sodium is an aeon, as sodium moves back into the blood, of course, water will move along with the sodium aeon. This is because of osmosis. You know, sodium cannot just move in without water. So water must flow back into the blood along with the sodium aeon. This whole process is also to balance the osmotic pressure of the blood. When the blood is short of sodium, it will affect the osmotic pressure of the blood. So the regulation of sodium concentration is to stabilize the osmotic pressure of the blood. Let me also point here that the regulation of sodium concentration usually goes along with the regulation of potassium. Potassium is another ion that is also found in the blood. So when the level of sodium or sodium concentration in the blood is reduced, it means the level of potassium concentration of the blood is increased. So we have increased potassium concentration and a reduction in sodium concentration. At this point, aldosterone is released from the adrenal gland. Adrenal gland comes back to the, to the kidneys and it affects its work at the tubule, distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts at the kidneys. And what does it do? It causes active reabsorption of sodium so more sodium is reabsorbed back into the blood and it causes secretion in potassium. It makes more potassium to leave, to leave the blood. So more potassium is secreted from the tubule into the urine and is excreted. So as sodium concentration is increasing in the blood, the concentration of potassium is decreasing. And at the end of the day, we have a normal 
blood or a blood that has a normal balance of sodium and potassium ion and homeostasis is restored in the blood. This is a process that happens when the sodium concentration in the blood is lower than normal. The reverse happens when the blood sodium concentration becomes higher than normal. In that case, there is no secretion of aldosterone. We don't need aldosterone to be secreted because we want the sodium to flow out with the urine. We don't need to reabsorb sodium back into the blood. So in that case, the brain stops the adrenal gland from secreting aldosterone. So the sodium ion can flow out and it will be excreted by the urine without going back into the blood. The third factor the kidney regulates is the pH level of the blood. Remember, the pH level is the level of acidity or alkalinity of the blood. How does the kidney regulate the pH level? The normal pH level of the human blood is slightly alkaline. It's at the range of 7.4, slightly alkaline. Now, when we consume certain food substances that are either too acidic or they are too alkaline, they either increase the pH level or decrease the pH level. When they increase the pH level, the blood becomes too alkaline. And as they decrease the pH level, the blood becomes too acidic. We don't need either situations. We need the blood pH level to be maintained at the normal range of 7.4. If it's too acidic or too alkaline, it will be dangerous for the cells to survive. So what happens then if the blood becomes too alkaline? If the blood becomes too alkaline, the tubules Remember, the tubules are where secretion and absorption are done. The tubules have to secrete more bicarbonate ions. Bicarbonate ions are the ions that increases the alkalinity of the blood, or of any substance. So bicarbonate ions have to leave the blood in order for the pH level to be balanced. As bicarbonate ions leave the blood, hydrogen ions are retained in the blood. Hydrogen helps to increase the acidity. So hydrogen ions are retained in the blood in order to balance the pH level. This whole process continues until the pH level of the blood is restored back to normal. So if the blood is too alkaline, more bicarbonate ion is secreted from the blood and more hydrogen ions are reabsorbed back into the blood to stabilize the pH level of the blood. How about when the pH level of the blood becomes too acidic? What do you think will happen? Of course, the reverse will happen. You have more secretion of hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ion will be retained in the blood. Bicarbonate ion being retained in the blood will decrease the acidity and make the pH of the blood become more alkaline and the excretion of hydrogen ion will reduce the acidity. This is the process that happens in the blood to regulate the pH level of the blood. Okay. At this point, we'll be looking at the various diseases that affect the kidney. They are generally called kidney diseases. These diseases infect the kidneys and disrupt the functions of the kidneys. They include glomerulonephritis, kidney stones, diuresis, edema, and kidney failure. Let's take a look at these diseases one after the other. The first here is glomerulonephritis. Can you pronounce that? glomerulonephritis. That's how it's pronounced. The word glomerulonephritis or the disease glomerulonephritis can also be called glomerulonephritis. So when you see glomerulonephritis, it means the same thing as glomerulonephritis. Glomerulonephritis is an inflammatory disease that affects both kidneys. It usually affects both kidneys. This kind of disease causes injuries to the glomerular capillaries. Remember the glomerular capillaries? We say they are capillaries that are located in the glomerulus. These are the capillaries, these tiny blood vessels here in the glomerulus. So glomerulonephritis causes injuries to these capillaries. It injures them. It makes them become weak, causing various types of injuries on these capillaries. And this makes the Capillary is unable to efficiently filter the blood. Remember the function of this glomerulus is to filter blood. So when blood flows into the glomerulus or into the capillaries through this channel, can you see it? Through this, through this tube, this blood vessel, the blood in the capillaries is filtered and 
blood cells and proteins are retained in the capillaries, while fluid and other ions or other substances flow out of the capillaries into the Bowman capsule. So we have blood cells retained in the capillaries, proteins retained in the capillaries, and fluid and other substances flow out of the capillaries to form the urine. Now when these capillaries are inflamed, that is when they are injured, the capillaries are no longer able to efficiently filter the blood. This will result in some blood cells and proteins leaking out of the capillaries. Remember the capillaries are injured, they have injuries, so blood cells and proteins will begin to leak out of the capillaries into the Bowman capsule. This will lead to the presence of blood cells and the presence of protein in the urine. So the urine or the fluid that is left in this Bowman capsule will contain some blood cells and some proteins. This is not good for the body. The body does not need to lose blood cells or proteins through the urine. So this is a disease condition. As the proteins begin to leak out of the capillaries and as blood cells leak out of the capillaries, the body will fall sick and the kidney is said to have glomerulonephritis. As this process continues, as, as this disease progresses, some white blood cells, part of the blood, and some dead tissues from the body that have leaked out of the capillaries will end up blocking the pores or the filtration pores of these capillaries. Remember, the pores are like tiny holes through which fluid passes out. So when dead cells and blood vessels block the holes, what will happen? The capillaries will no longer be able to filter. They will be blocked. So fluid or a lesser quantity of fluid flows out of the capillaries. This is also not good for the body. That's why this disease is very dangerous. They block the glomeruli, they block the capillaries, they also block the Bowman's capsule, they also block some channels here in the Bowman's capsule, and at the end of the day, they cause total blockage. So fluid no longer comes out efficiently from the capillaries, so more fluid is left in various parts of the body that should have been filtered out of the blood. So in that case, we have an inflamed glomerulus. Remember, glomerulus is part of the nephron that is scattered all over the kidney. So the glomerulus are inflamed and it becomes, somehow the kidney becomes swollen, a bit swollen. And we say it leads to the presence of blood and protein cells in the urine. So we have this kind of urine that has the presence of blood. So the urine becomes slightly reddish, indicating that there are blood cells in it. Glomerular nephritis also causes the retention of fluid in the body. Yes, because the capillaries are blocked and fluid no longer leaves the blood into the urine, these fluids will be retained in various parts of the body. And when they are retained, they cause parts of the body to swell. They cause parts of the body such as the feet, the hands, and even the face to swell. So it results in someone having a puffy face where the whole face is swollen as a result of the accumulation of fluid in the tissues. Glomerulonephritis also leads to the reduction in the volume of urine produced. So people that have glomerulonephritis produce very little urine. This is because the capillaries are blocked. So more urine or more fluid cannot pass out of the blood to form urine. In most cases, as in people suffering from glomerulonephritis, in most of the cases, the inflammation or the injuries subside. They subside after treatment and the kidneys are restored back to normal. The kidneys become normal again. But in few cases, glomerulonephritis does not subside. So in these cases, the kidneys get damaged and they are permanently blocked. This is not so good. So people suffering from kidney diseases should pay attention to it in order not to get their kidneys blocked. Glomerulonephritis occurs in people of all ages, young and old. But when glomerulonephritis occur in children, it is usually after an infection with a bacterium called streptococcus. This is a bacterium that causes certain diseases such as tonsillitis. This bacterium causes sore throat and some kind of skin infection. So usually when a person is infected with tonsillitis or sore throat or that particular skin infection caused by this bacterium, most times, it will result in glomerulonephritis. So people who suffer from these illnesses are prone to coming down with glomerulonephritis. This is the case for children, actually. The second disease we shall be looking at is kidney stones. 
Kidney stones are hard, stony masses that are formed in the kidneys. They are formed as a result of the crystallization of mineral substances or organic matters. Crystallization here just refers to when mineral elements accumulate and they form a hard mass. So they form a hard mass. We say these mineral elements have crystallized. They've come together to form a hard mass. These pieces of stones or these hard masses, they build up together, they accumulate in the kidneys and they become kidney stones. So we have certain minerals coming together to form a hard mass they are, and they are called kidney stones. Kidney stones are not good for the kidneys. We don't need stones in the kidneys. We only need fluid and mineral elements, no stones. So kidney stone disease occurs mostly when the urine is too concentrated for a long period of time. And what could cause the urine to be too concentrated? What could make the urine to be too concentrated? Our urine can be too concentrated when we drink little water over time. When we don't drink sufficient quantity of water, we end up producing concentrated urine. This is not so good. We need to drink adequate quantity of water. Also, our urine can be too concentrated when we eat very high quantity of salt. When we consume too much salt over time, it will lead to the production of concentrated urine. And the production of concentrated urine for a long period of time could cause kidney stones. This is because the minerals that are found in the urine, or organic elements found in the urine, could gather or come together to form the kidney stones. So this is what a kidney stone looks like. This is now the kidney. So these minerals crystallize to form this kind of stone. You can see the stones. These stones are not good for a kidney. And it happens when the urine is usually too concentrated. Kidney stones have different effects. Usually when the stones are small, there are small kidney stones, they do not cause so much harm because they are usually passed out through the urinary tract without so much trouble. So if the stone is very small, let's say if it's of this, this tiny size, it can be passed out with the urine without causing so much trouble, isn't it? But when the stones are big, when they are as large as this, or this, or this, as it's going to flow from, with the urine through the urinary tract, they will cause so much pain and so much discomfort. And this is why kidney stones should be prevented. So large stones will cause severe pains and they may end up blocking the flow of urine. They could also lead to the presence of blood in the urine because as they begin to cause pains, they can inflame the tissues of the urinary tract and cause the leakage of blood cells into the urine. Kidney stones can damage the kidneys. Yes, they can damage the kidneys, especially if they are not properly treated. Examples of minerals that can cause kidney stones are minerals such as calcium. When you have a high concentration of calcium in the blood, it could crystallize and form kidney stones. Other minerals include uric acid and cysteine. All of these minerals can crystallize and form kidney stones. So it is advised that we drink adequate volume of water regularly. The next disease is osmotic diuresis. Osmotic diuresis. This disease is simply the excessive production of large quantities of urine by the kidneys. So in this case, the kidneys produce large quantities or large volume of urine and it is frequent. What causes osmotic diuresis? Osmotic diuresis is usually a normal regulatory process of the kidneys. When you drink too much water, of course, the excess quantity of water has to leave the body. So the kidneys work harder to produce large volume of urine and you tend to urinate frequently. In that case, it is diuresis, but it is a normal process. Also, when a person sweats less, when you sweat less, it means large volume or more volume of water is retained in the body. The kidney will also work harder to excrete this excess volume of water. So it is normal at that stage. However, osmotic diuresis here now is a disease condition that occurs when certain substances such as glucose gets down to the tubule of the kidney, that's the nephron tubule, and when they get down to the tubule of the kidney, sometimes because of the disease condition, they are not reabsorbed from the tubule, so they stay in the urine at the tubule. And when they are there, it means they must attract more water into the tubule. So when we have certain substances like glucose in the tube, too much, let me say the concentration of the 
glucose in the tube is too high, they will attract water because we need water to flush them out. So they will attract water to the urine and the volume of urine becomes too high and large volumes of urine is produced. So we have, sometimes the urine is usually diluted. So you produce large quantities of urine. In that case, it becomes excessive. You see the person urinating frequently, usually in large volume. This is not so good. Osmotic diuresis now, usually seen in people suffering from diabetes insipidus or diabetes mellitus. That is when it's a disease condition. It is seen in this kind of case. Diabetes insipidus or mellitus are just different types of diabetes. In diabetes insipidus, the secretion of ADH, remember ADH from the pituitary gland, the secretion of ADH is stopped or greatly reduced. This is a disease that causes ADH not to be secreted in the body. So when ADH is not secreted, it means water will not be reabsorbed from the kidney. This will lead to the production of large quantities of urine because of the increased volume of water in the urine. In diabetes mellitus, in this case, there is an increase in the concentration of glucose in the urine. This disease causes the blood cells not to be able to use glucose. So the glucose is excreted in the urine. And of course, as the glucose is excreted, it will attract large volume of water to be excreted along with it. That is the case for osmotic diuresis. The next one we shall be looking at is edema. This is pronounced edema. Edema is simply the accumulation of fluid in the body. Accumulation of fluid in the tissues of the body. Edema usually occurs as a result of several illnesses. Edema can occur when the heart is troubled. It can also occur when other parts of the body are troubled. Edema causes parts of the body such as the feet, the hands, and the faces to swell because fluid is accumulated. The kidneys can no longer excrete the fluid that should have been excreted through the urine. The urine is left in the body and it causes parts of the body or tissues of the body to swell. So you have all of these cases, swollen feet, swollen hands, swollen faces, and all the rest. Edema is usually seen when someone is infected with kidney diseases, any of the kidney diseases, some of the kidney diseases, including glomerulonephritis, kidney stones, or even kidney failure. In these cases, the kidneys are not able to produce enough or adequate quantity of urine. So they are not able to excrete the excess volume of water from the body. So the fluid is retained in various tissues in the body. In edema, a large quantity of urine or fluid, a large quantity of fluid, large volume of fluid is retained in the cells. And when they are retained in the cells, Remember, the cells do not need too much or excess fluid. They can rupture. When they, are, when they are submerged in excess fluid, they can rupture and they are destroyed. But in this case, the fluid leak out of the cell because it's too much. The quantity of fluid in the cells are too much. They leak out of the cells and they flow into the interstitial spaces. Interstitial spaces are the spaces between the cells in the body. So they flow into these spaces, leaking out of the cells. And when they flow into the spaces, they accumulate in the tissue and they cause various, they cause swelling in various parts of the body. The last disease we shall be looking at is kidney failure. Kidney failure occurs as a result of advanced kidney diseases. That's after several diseases have infected the kidney and the kidneys are not restored back to normal, the kidneys will end up failing. Kidney failure is a disease condition whereby the kidneys are completely damaged and they can no longer perform their functions. And I said it occurs as a result of advanced kidney or prolonged kidney diseases. Kidney failure can also occur in people that are diabetic or people that have heart attack. All of these diseases can affect the functions of the kidney and they can end up causing the kidneys to fail. Kidney failure sometimes is temporary and at other times it may be permanent. So we have temporary or permanent kidney failure. Now, when kidney failure is temporary, this means that the kidneys may recover. After treatment, they may recover and they may return to their normal functions. But when the kidney disease is permanent, it means that the kidneys are totally damaged and they are beyond recovery. So you can see a sample of kidneys that are totally damaged. These are cases of kidney failure. Patients with just one damaged kidney, remember we have two kidneys in the body, we have a pair.
patients with just one damaged kidney can live successfully on the healthy kidney. You now we have two kidneys, so if one of the, a person's kidney is damaged, the person can survive with the remaining healthy kidney. However, in cases where both kidneys are damaged, both kidneys are damaged, this is damaged, and this other one is damaged, the person needs a replacement. The person needs another kidney. Without the kidneys, the body cannot filter or excrete urine. So the person needs an urgent treatment. In that case, the kidneys are either replaced through transplants, they are replaced with a healthy kidney through transplants, or the patient is placed on dialysis. Dialysis is like an artificial machine that helps to filter the blood. Quickly, let's review the effects of the various kidney diseases on the body or on homeostasis. We said kidney diseases could lead to inability of the kidneys to produce urine. This is seen in the cases where the capillaries and glomerulus are blocked. The person will not be able to produce adequate volume of urine. Kidney diseases could also lead to frequent urination. This is seen in the cases where a larger volume of urine is produced. The person would urinate more frequently. It can also lead to acidosis. In cases where the kidneys or the glomerular capillaries are blocked, acid will be retained in the blood, or rather the pH level of the blood will reduce and the blood will become more acidic. This is called acidosis. Kidney disease could also lead to increased blood pressure, high blood pressure, because of the blockage of the glomerular capillaries and all the processes, the blood pressure could increase. Kidney diseases can also lead to high level of urea in the blood. Remember, the kidneys excrete uric acid or urea. So when the kidneys are blocked, you have more urea in the blood. It could also lead to edema. In most cases where the kidney glomerular capillaries are blocked, fluid will be retained in the body. And lastly, kidney diseases can lead to loss of proteins and loss of blood cells. All of these effects disrupt the normal internal environment of the body and they should be prevented. Okay, having looked at the various kidney diseases, I'd like us to examine some of the remedies to kidney diseases. For people already infected with kidney diseases, these are some of the things they should do. Kidney diseases are life-threatening and they should be properly treated. Some of the remedies to kidney diseases is one, medical treatments. People who have kidney diseases should seek immediate medical attention. They should see a doctor and they should be properly checked by a doctor for early diagnosis and for immediate treatment. They don't need to delay on this. The second remedy is rest and warmth. People suffering from kidney diseases or kidney disease patients should ensure to observe good rest. They should rest properly as well as protect themselves from extreme weather conditions such as cold or heat. You know what cold and heat could do to the kidneys, right? They should protect themselves from these extreme conditions. This is because these conditions may require the intervention of the kidney. When one is exposed to cold, the kidneys will have to secrete more urine because such persons will, not, will no longer be able to sweat or such persons may not sweat at the moment. So the kidneys will have to excrete more fluid through the urine. And when one is exposed to heat, it means such a person sweats more. So the kidneys will have to produce a reduced quantity of urine. All of these conditions may require the intervention of the kidney. So kidney disease patients should protect themselves from these conditions. Rest and warmth may help the kidneys recover in a good time. Dietary control. This is another remedy to kidney diseases. People suffering from kidney diseases should stay away from certain food substances or they should minimize their consumption of certain food substances. Food substances such as proteinous food, fatty food, and food that are high in carbohydrates should be reduced. Their consumption should be reduced to the barest minimum. They should take just what is required by the body in order to reduce the workload of the kidney. If you consume too much of these food substances, the kidney may have to work harder to help excrete the excess. So in cases where edema is present, as people suffering from kidney diseases that has resulted in edema, such patients should reduce their intake of water and their intake of salt. All of these could worsen the condition. Removal of sources of infection. 
kidney disease patients to ensure to remove whatever may have caused the infection. They should look out for streptococcal infection. Remember we said streptococcal can predispose someone to glomerulonephritis. They should also ensure to eliminate diabetes. They should do all of these to ensure that the disease does not reoccur, that kidney diseases do not reoccur even after treatment. Dialysis and kidney transplant. This is the end case remedy for kidney diseases. In a case where the kidney has been blocked, that's in kidney failure patients, the kidney failure can be treated through dialysis or kidney transplant. Now, this is done when the kidney failure is a permanent kidney failure, when it can no longer recover. In dialysis, it is a treatment that filters the blood using a machine. In dialysis, a machine, it acts like an artificial kidney, is used to filter the blood of the sick person. So it helps to filter the blood in place of the kidney. Now, because it is a machine, you should know that this treatment will not be so efficient. Even if it is efficient, it will not last for too long. A patient suffering from kidney failure that has been placed under dialysis may have to keep going to the hospital to get his or her blood filtered. The next option is kidney transplants. Kidney transplants is the replacement of a damaged kidney with a healthy one through surgery. Now, in kidney transplants, the patient needs a donor. He needs another person who is willing to donate one of his kidneys. Remember we said one can survive with a single a kidney. So a patient will need either his friend, his family members, or even anybody to donate a kidney, a healthy kidney to him to replace the damaged one. So in kidney transplants, we have a replacement. This is the donor. That's the person donating the kidney. One of his kidney is removed, and the kidney is inserted in the body of the patient, the recipient. That's the person who requires a replaced kidney. All of these are treatments to kidney failures. Okay, we'll quickly summarize all we've been learning in today's class. We started by saying the kidneys regulate water volumes, they regulate the pH level of the blood, and they also regulate the electrolyte concentration of the blood. We looked at the concentration of sodium and also the concentration of potassium. They do all of these to balance the osmotic pressure of the blood. Diseases that impair the functions of the kidneys are glomerulonephritis, kidney stones, diuresis, osmotic edema, and kidney failure. Some of the remedies to kidney diseases include medical treatment, rest and warmth, dietary control, and removal of sources of infection. And at the worst case, when a patient is down with kidney failure, if either the kidneys are replaced through transplant or the person is placed on dialysis. At this point, I would like to find out if you've learned from this lesson by taking these questions. The first question says, DASH is the hormone that causes active reabsorption of sodium at the tubules. A, aldosterone, B, osmoreceptors, C, adrenal, and D, antidiuretic. The correct answer is option A, aldosterone. It is a hormone secreted by the adrenal gland and it causes active reabsorption of sodium. The second question, which of the following statements is true about glomerulonephritis? A, dead cells and proteins block the tubule. B, stones are formed in the kidney. C, fluid flow out of the kidney, and D, the kidneys fail to work. The correct answer here is option A. In glomerulonephritis, dead cells and proteins may block the glomerular capillaries. We have come to the end of today's class. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you've learned so much about the kidneys. I'd like to have you in our next class, where we shall continue our lesson on the maintenance of internal environment, and where we get to talk about other organs of homeostasis. Until then, bye.